Okay, welcome back, everyone. Okay, I am very, very pleased to announce our next speaker. Bethany McGowan is an associate professor in the libraries and School of Information Studies at Purdue University. Her teaching and research focuses on developing health information literacy interventions and helping others to effectively use data and information to solve real world problems. Professor McGowan has partnered with organizations such as the World Health Organization and U.S. Department of State to study and develop solutions to myths and disinformation challenges. She is a 2023-2024 Fulbright Scholar to Finland, where she will examine how regulatory and ethical principles can mitigate the spread of myths and disinformation. In her talk, Serving, Service Learning Projects Can Improve Societal Resilience to Misinformation, Professor McGowan will discuss how information-seeking behavior can be modulated by broader social, cultural, environmental, and historical influences. She will outline how service learning projects can raise our consciousness of and sensitivity to authentic community information needs, and how this can aid in the creation and assessment of culturally relevant information literacy interventions. She'll conclude by exploring by exploring how ethical and regulatory principles can improve access to evidence-based information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's just dive right in because I know that you are going to be listening to me for the next 40 minutes and I want to make it engaging. Um, so service learning projects can improve societal resilience to misinformation. I use misinformation in my title, but a lot of what I'm looking at is misinformation, also disinformation and malinformation. And I hope you were in um, yesterday's presentation and paying attention to how those things um, are different. Um, I'll also review that. <laughs> so in today's presentation, I'll be discussing how information-seeking behavior in black American communities can be modulated by social, cultural, environmental, and historical influences. I'll also discuss strategies for raising one's consciousness, consciousness of and sensitivity to authentic community health information needs, illustrating how service learning projects can inform the development of culturally relevant health literacy interventions, and finally, and by exploring how ethical and regulatory principles, like policy making, um, can improve access to evidence-based interventions and information. I should start with some funding acknowledgements. This presentation is possible because of funding from the IMLS. Um, my specific project is understanding the health information seeking behaviors of black Americans, a cultural perspective. And I would also like to give a shout out to the Purdue University Libraries who funded uh, one of my OUR scholars whose research that I use in this presentation. So shout out to Alicia Stavance, um, and I will be highlighting her work here. I thought we could start by talking about infodemic management. This is sort of a health-centered approach, but as I'm speaking, I hope that you can make sort of a, a, a broader, uh, take a broader understanding of some of the principles that are laid out by the World Health Organization um, when they talk about mis- and disinformation and information management. So the WHO defines an infodemic as a flood of information that spreads alongside an ep epidemic or a public health crisis. Some of the information is accurate, but some of it is considered mis- or disinformation. So the thing about infodemic management that's interesting is it is combating mis- and disinformation, but it's also teaching people how to assess information quality overall, so they're also able to recognize um, good and accurate information when they come across it. Infra, uh, infodemic management should include supporting, developing, and applying solutions that provide knowledge and tools to individuals and communities. And so they have sort of two, a breakdown of two ways that they uh, apply these tools. The first tools are upstream interventions, and that's all about promoting accurate information. And then the downstream interventions are all about minimizing and mitigating harmful mis- and disinformation. 
So the WHO Public Health uh, Research Agenda for Managing Infodemics really helped uh, sort of help me formulate my own research agenda. This was released in 2020, and it really prioritizes um, research around what I would consider information literacy, but what they call infodemic management. And the call for action specifically expresses concern uh, for people's ability to act on the health information that they receive uh, and calls for culturally relevant and community-based interventions. In their concept analysis of health information seeking behavior, authors Margaret Zimmerman and George Shaw Jr., who are both um, library and information professional scholars, discuss how people are often unsure of how to act on the health information that they have required, especially when that information is from an online source. And they also highlight the need for interventions tailored to specific community groups and for librarian led workshops, community partnerships. Uh, between librarians and healthcare providers, and then library sessions with community members and stakeholders. So between these two sort of calls for action, uh, we see the need for tailored, uh, community-engaged action. And that's coming from the librarian world and also coming from our public health allies. Infodemic management off, uh, efforts are especially crucial in vulnerable, minoritized, and marginalized communities who often suffer disproportionately from e epidemic disease. And that's sort of, uh, sort of the premise behind my, my grant and my research. Disparities and prevalence in health outcomes reflect a complex set of factors. So we know it's not just one thing. It's not just information literacy. There are also several other things, including systemic racism, inequality in access to health services, educational opportunities, occupational differences, and knowledge gaps. And all of these factors actually influence health information seeking behavior. And what that also tells me is that it's going to take sort of a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary action to actually help solve this problem. So let's talk about democracy, civic engagement, and information literacy. When I first started my research, I wasn't thinking about democracy and civic engagement. But as I continued on, I um, I'm learning that it actually plays a, a sort of a huge role um, in, pe in people's education and in pe how people look for information. Um, I think that the uh, presentation before mine was actually uh, great because they talked about this just a little bit and I'll be deep diving into it a little bit more. So we know that diet and lifestyle aren't enough to explain disease rates and maternal health problems in minority communities. Um, and we're starting to understand that social well-being is also a really essential component of health. Um, for example, the pandemic made the chronic uh, stress faced by those with limited access to broadband connections, safe public spaces, or other civic uh, resources more visible than ever. Uh, we also know that marginalized communities are disproportionately targeted by dis and malinformation campaigns that attempt to reduce their civic engagement. So here's where those uh, definitions between mis, dis, and malinformation come in. So we know misinformation is actually uh, unintentional, but dis and malinformation are intentionally spreading uh, what's often misinformation to actually change someone's behavior. Uh, and malinformation is a little bit different from disinformation because malinformation might actually be true, but the intent behind it is malicious. And if you can remember Dr. Cook's presentation from yesterday, she talked about doxing as a sort of type of malinformation. Um, so research findings are also establishing direct and indirect links between reduced civic engagement and exposure to disinformation and malinformation in marginalized communities, which is a really compelling finding for me and is the thing that uh, actually got me very interested in policy and in civic engagement and how it's linked to information literacy. So civic health, population health, and information literacy go hand in hand. And I have that hugely written out because I thought it was really important and really compelling. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about the civic engagement a little bit. Neglected infrastru uh, civic infrastructure, schools, parks, community centers, 
libraries, and other public spaces that help foster a sense of belonging, uh, coupled with barriers to participation in civic life, aren't just manifestations of poor governance, according to a 2023 County Health Rankings and Roadmaps report from the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. We know that they have very real health consequences. Uh, and this is a chart that looks at variations and measures of civic in uh, infrastructure among regions with types of longstanding discrimination and disinvestment. So the regions that they look at are tribal areas, Appalachia, the Black Belt, which is most of the South minus Florida. And I'm a Southerner, so I'm perfectly happy with them leaving off Florida. But if you're a Floridian and think you're a Southerner, you might take issue with <laughs> Wisconsin's definition of, of the Black Belt. Um, but, uh, and then finally, the US-Mexico border. Um, so here we see um, each, uh, each sort of region color coordinated, and then the rest of the nation is represented by this dotted line. And you can see that for most of these areas, um, you know, the uh, areas with, uh, that have a, a long history of uh, discrimination and disin uh, disinvestment are underrepresented. So in access to broadband, in access to libraries, in access to parks and recreation facilities, uh, access to adequately funded schools, which is a little bit alarming that the South is so uh, poorly represented there, and then organizations for social association. Um, so every single area, pretty much, we see uh, sort of um, areas with high percents of marginalized communities um, really struggling. And I do have all of my things linked out if you want to go take a deeper look at some of this data. So what I appreciated about what the uh, Population Health Institute at University of Wisconsin did is they didn't just present the problem because this is actually a little bit depressing. They also talk about potential solutions. And I got really excited because I think some of the solutions that they talk about are things that librarians are already doing and at least already thinking about and really uh, present lots of opportunities for collaboration. Um, so some of their recommendations for addressing some of these social factors and getting people more engaged in civics start with investing in civic infrastructure. So obviously, if you put money into something, your results are, uh, the results uh, are probably going to be a lot better, um, particularly in the public spaces that connect communities and they call out uh, libraries, um, libraries specifically. Um, so advocating then for investment in civic infrastructure might be something that librarians should be doing. Youth leadership and mentoring programs can help foster a sense of belonging in communities, and this can lead to uh, more civic engagement. And as a professor and somebody who do, uh, does a lot of teaching, um, I was really uh, sort of uh, moved by opportunities that um, are presented by uh, mentoring the youth, and I'll talk about an example of that when I go through the case study examples. Commitment to uh, democratic processes and opportunities that allow citizens to have a say in the matters that affect their lives, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand with my next point, which is that, surprise, gerrymandering, laws that make it more difficult to vote by restricting eligibility or registration um, or otherwise disenfranchising voters, we know present structural barriers to civic health. So I'll wrap all that up by saying libraries and librarians are playing an important role in the infodemic management response. That role is being recognized, and that's evidenced by uh, the inclusion of libraries and librarians in the WHO report and also in that uh, University of Wisconsin report that I reference. Um, providing access to upstream and downstream literacy interventions that help bridge the gap between civic health and population health. So if you're somebody that's interested in doing this kind of work, what else should you be uh, thinking about? So I'll talk about some considerations for designing relevant responses to community needs. First, the digital divide still exists. <laughs> 
people were talking about the digital divide when I was in middle school, and that was a long time ago. So since at least the early uh, 2000s, we've known that there exists uh, a, a divide between um, people's uh, ability to access the internet and to access health information technologies. Um, but the other thing that I thought was really interesting is racial differences also exist in health information seeking, as well as in confidence in information and trust of information sources. And these are well documented in the behavioral health literature. A lot of scholars and public health practitioners actually expect it to see a decrease in these differences as the internet emerged and more people had access to it. But I'll give a spoiler alert, that hasn't happened. Concerns remain that unequal use of technology is actually exacerbating differences in attitudes and behaviors. And if you remember that slide, that image that I showed a little while ago, we know that access to resources like broadband are actually um, challenging in minority communities. In a 2016 study, marginalized groups were less likely to be online and reported lower use of social media when compared to other groups. And I haven't updated this slide, but that 2023 slide that I, I showed you, the policy report, actually shows that these numbers are still or haven't changed very much. Um, this suggests a continuing divide in the internet access and also in the use of health information technology. Trust is also another major issue. Trust is more likely when information is delivered by a messenger who is already known to the community members and who already has a positive re rep, uh, relationship with the community or community member. So if the person is known but not respected, that's not gonna help you. You need your collaborator to really be someone who is already known and trusted. Um, studies document lower trust in health professionals and healthcare institutions among patients of color, which may influence their receptivity to healthcare advice. And I'll talk about why this is important in just a minute. Social media uh, can also be a very useful tool for reaching members of uh, minority groups, but you do need to still ask yourself, one, um, if you're gonna use social media for messaging, do most people in your community have access to the internet? We know that's a challenge. Um, who are you targeting? Because some demographics prefer different platforms. For example, Facebook over Instagram. I taught a class last semester where I talked about Facebook and my students were like, that's for old people. We don't use Facebook, they're on Instagram. So if you're a millennial like me and you're trying to reach millennials, Facebook might be fine. But for Gen Z and later, Instagram seems to be something that's still a little bit more relevant. So really be thinking about your platforms. Positive or negative tones work differently for different people. So you might have to run an analysis to see, does your group prefer to be scared into submission or do, do they prefer sort of positive tones? And then um, who do you want your influencers to be? Uh, traditional celebrities or social media uh, people? And then intersectionality. Um, many demographic characteristics like age, sex, and socioeconomic status, and even language preferences are important to consider when you are talking about um, delivering messages and delivering information. For example, one study of health information seeking among African American women found that perceptions around race and lower income status actually presented a major barrier in their health information seeking. But regardless of race or ethnicity, subgroups exist that are defined by education, religion, political views, and other factors. So people of color are not a monolith, and when you are thinking about how you want to target people, concordance across multiple self-reported identities is probably the most influential factor. And so this is sort of marketing 101. If you want to reach people and be successful, uh, really understanding who they are and trying to uh, hit each area of their identity uh, and account for that is really important. And while you're thinking about tailored inter interventions, you should also be thinking about cultural humility, cultural relevance, and language preferences. And if you not aren't a part of the community that you're uh, reaching out to, really having a partner that is, is going to be crucial. 
And then educational campaigns through trusted outlets. This is a place where I really see libraries and librarians shining. You want to ensure that your messages are accurate, available, and comprehensible. Um, I like to advocate for libraries as physical or digital trusted community places that connect people. And I think, you know, I think public libraries are having a hard time right now with a lot of the book banning conversations. But historically, and still for a lot of people, the public library is sort of seen as a community place and a, a sort of a trusted place. And so I think librarians can really take advantage of that. Um, uh, it's already seen as a place for finding information, for discussing information hygiene, um, for talking about information and media literacy skills. Um, for individuals and for communities. And if you want to see a public health practitioner who really uh, is hyping up libraries and librarians, consider following the WHO infodemic management team lead, Tina Pernat. She's very active on LinkedIn. Uh, and she recently, maybe two years ago now, wrote uh, sort of this news article, Superpower of Libraries to be our buffer to the infodemic, that talks about ways that she sees libraries and public health practitioners partnering. And I will share my slides because I know I have a lot of links that might be interesting for people. Um, <laughs> Um, racial concurrence of messengers and receivers. Oh, this is an interesting study. So um, I didn't talk about this before, but these results are based on a systematic review that I conducted. Um, and one of the studies found that racial concordance of messengers and receivers is particularly important in communicating about emotionally charged um, and politicized issues. And it found that for um, emotionally charged issues, information seeking was higher among African American participants after they viewed messages that were presented by an African American physician. Other tailoring of the content, such as plain language messaging and good design practices, did not make a significant difference. So for this study, uh, the key difference really was hearing um, about something that was uh, perceived as emotionally charged from somebody that looked like you. So to reiterate my previous point, racial differences persist in health information seeking and confidence in information and trust of information sources. So let's talk about what that means exactly. First, findings from a pooled cross-sectional survey that assessed racial disparities in health information seeking behavior from 2007 to 2017 offer some insight. Um, they found that the availability of health information on the internet probably increased black respondents' confidence in accessing health information. So this is a positive finding. People uh, felt more confident in their ability to access health information online. But that widespread availability of information by itself wasn't sufficient to overcome some barriers posed by health literacy to health information seeking behavior. So that same study found that persistent lower rates of health information seeking and confidence in accessing health information for black respondents relative to white respondents. So even though black respondents uh, uh, noted an improvement, it was not the same level as their uh, white respondents. It also found increasingly higher rates of trust and more diverse sources of health information in minority communities. And I thought this was probably the most compelling find for somebody interested in developing health literacy interventions because it suggested at the end that black Americans may actually prefer communication strategies that focus on oral delivery over written delivery. So I'm, I'm going to be uh, sort of creating interventions. I want to, yes, focus on some written delivery, but also focus on interventions that are spoken. So looking at like videos and podcasts as alternatives to um, just websites, for example. All right, that was a lot to think about. <laughs> a lot of uh, sort of um, theory, I think, and uh, things to consider. But what does this actually look like in practice? At the end of the day, I am a practicing librarian. I like research, but I'm really all about getting out and doing things. So let's talk about some of the things that I've been doing. I think that service learning is an approach that addresses a lot of the issues that have been brought up um, in previous research. 
And if you don't know what service learning is, it's an educational approach that combines learning objectives with community service in order to provide a pragmatic and progressive learning experience while meeting societal needs. So this idea of bringing students from the classroom into the community and helping to solve a world world problem. At Purdue, I design and teach service learning courses that center around trust building and establishing sustainable information literacy interventions that can be tailored for use by a diverse range of communities. A good example of this is Diplomacy Lab. Um, in 2022 and 2023, um, I actually co-taught this course with Matt Hanna, who was here but is now go gone. <laughs> but you probably heard Matt speak yesterday. Um, and the project that we worked on was um, strategies for identifying dis and misinformation. Um, so let me talk a little about a bit about what diplomacy labs are. Um, diplomacy lab projects enable the U.S. Department of State to course source research and innovation related to foreign policy by harnessing the efforts of students and faculty experts at university nationwide. And the thing that I really like about Diplomacy Lab is whoever, uh, <laughs> Whoever came up with the Diplomacy Lab uh, concept, I think, was very much aware of service learning and teaching and instruction pedagogy. Because one of the things that they require is that all of their projects be student-led. Um, as faculty, you are there to provide structure. You are there to provide expertise. Um, and then you also sort of provide the frame for the type of deliverable you want students to create. But students are responsible for coming up with the course deliverable, for um, talking to the diplomats at the State Department, for refining their deliverables, um, and then for presenting their final project to the State Department. So it really does take one of the recommendations that we saw earlier in that civic uh, engagement uh, policy report finding, the one that talks about um, engaging youth and younger people um, to heart. And that's really one of the things that I appreciate about this project. Um, they are, as I mentioned, student-led under the guidance of faculty experts, and then U.S. diplomats provide iterative feedback. So in our project, we challenge students to develop tools and processes that diplomats in the State Department's Operations Center, um, those diplomats are called watch officers, and they're specially trained um, to do their jobs um, that they could use to identify mis and disinformation campaigns on open source media. Um, so OPS, that's what they call it, is the state's crisis management hub uh, responsible for collecting and disseminating information about breaking events and then also facilitating a whole uh, government response to a crisis. So these diplomats are trained to sort of troll social media, to um, look at breaking news, and anytime they see something that the Secretary of State should be interested in and should know about, they are uh, responsible for trying to report it up as soon as they figure out if it's accurate or not. Um, so there's a, a balance between uh, reporting accurate information and also trying to report information uh, as timely as possible. So the challenge that these diplomats were having is they were very good at the accuracy. They almost never reported mis or disinformation, but they were very slow. So we uh, wanted to create a tool that would help them identify accurate information a little bit faster. So in spring 2022 and fall 2022, um, we taught a 400 level libraries slash honors course. Um, that built a social listening dashboard. So this is sort of automating that process for um, figuring out if something was mis or disinformation. Our students also wrote a policy report and then they developed a checklist that helped improve the speed and reliability for which diplomats identified mis and disinformation on social media. And I say on social media, but they were looking at Twitter specifically for this project. Um, so as I mentioned before, I think this is a direct tie-in to um, one of the, the recommendations for engaging young people. And I had the honor of working with two uh, Diplomacy Lab alumni in 2022, 2023, so this academic year, um, as OUR scholars. And during the Diplomacy Lab, we could really see how excited students were um, to talk about democracy and to talk, to talk about diplomacy. Um, and someone mentioned earlier 
earlier whether or not students were bored by diplomacy, and I can assure you they were not. As soon as they found uh, a, a problem and were challenged with developing a solution, I think they were immediately engaged. Um, and then we saw uh, a sort of a long-term engagement even after the project was up. So uh, Matt and I wrote reference letters and our students went to law school and they wanted to talk about mis and disinformation. We have students uh, working on a study currently um, that is looking at you know how black women are targeted when they run for office with mis and dis and um, malinformation campaigns. Um, so really a long tail of research coming out of the diplomacy lab um, experience that our undergraduate students have. And you missed it, but if this presentation had been last week, I would tell you to go check out my students' posters at the OUR conference, but they presented on Tuesday. So um, if you're interested, go online and you can at least read their abstracts. Um, but I will say that this is a, an opportunity that the students had to actually talk to diplomats. It got them very excited, and I feel like the work that they're doing, um, they're going to be doing for the next couple years at least. The other class that I taught and uh, am, am teaching, or I'm, I'm going to teach, <laughs> is uh, Health Literacy Instruction for Diverse Communities. Um, this is a partnership with community stakeholders where students employ uh, crit critical pedagogy and dialogic action to design health information literacy instructional experiences. And I have our students um, starting out by listening to community concerns and questions, which looks like stakeholder interviews and focus group interviews, so they're trained to do that. Um, promoting understanding of risk, promoting health expert advice, building resilience to mis- and disinformation, and then finally incorporating culturally sensitive techniques that we talked about a little bit earlier to engage and empower communities to take positive action. Uh, I had planned to start this class here in Indiana, collaborating with IU Health um, and a couple of smaller stakeholder organizations, but then I found out I got a Fulbright, so I'm actually going to be launching this in Finland, uh, and I know when people think of Finland, they think like the whitest place on earth. <laughs> Like my parents literally said, oh, you're going from Indiana to Finland. Like you just don't like diversity, huh? <laughs> Um, but they do have a small but growing immigrant population, and a lot of their immigrants come from African nations. So I am able to sort of continue looking at um, information-seeking behaviors in black diasporic communities in a way that I think will be really interesting. Um, so the project partners for that um, project are a, a government agency and also a small grassroots organization that supports um, immigration services. Um, so I'm really excited for, for these, and then um, I do plan to um, continue with this course in Indiana, where my collaborators will likely be um, IU Health as our major healthcare organization, and then a couple of smaller grassroots organizations. So what are some, I want to leave you with some of my overall strategies for success if you're going to be engaging in service learning work, some things that I had to figure out sort of on the fly here. First, it really is helpful if you establish the framework for your instruction with a large, well-resourced partner. <laughs> um, so it really helps. So for both of my um, courses, um, I haven't actually launched the healthcare course, but I already talked to IU and had their buy-in. And then the State Department course, obviously the State Department was our big um, uh, partner. But it really helped to have somebody who was already well-resourced, who was already sort of viewed as um, sort of the leader in the area that we were looking at, and then already engaged and uh, embedded in the community that allowed for me to get a sort of a broad perspective of what was going on. So talking to the nurses, for example, at IU Health and talking to their outreach coordinator really helped me have a really broad perspective of, of what was going on in the community in terms of healthcare needs. Um, but one of the things that I already knew from my own research is a lot of times your bigger, larger healthcare providers or government agencies aren't trusted in the communities. And this is where also having a smaller community partner who is can be really helpful. So this first is focusing on your large partner who can come in with the resources, who can give you the bigger picture, and then bringing them to the table. 
Um, the second tip is you really want to make sure you are um, including all your community partners and key stakeholders at the beginning of the project design stage. So even if you are starting with a large, well-resourced partner, you don't want to do a bunch of designing and planning with them and then bring your community, your smaller community partner on um, as sort of a secondary thing. It really does help if you have all of your key players um, talking to each other at the very beginning of your project design stage. You want to seek out grassroots organizations that are already trusted and embedded in the community. When I started my work, I thought, oh, I can do this. I will be the person leading this, this project. And then I realized that I don't know anything about the community around me. I come to Purdue, I go home, I'm not super uh, engaged with my local community. So it really was necessary for me as somebody who was sort of coming in as an outsider and not already seen as a trusted partner to find somebody who was and collaborate with them. If you are, like a lot of public librarians are already trusted in the community and the, you know they might not have to worry about this, but depending on your place, you definitely want to have a partner that's already trusted. Um, I found that collaborating with local food shelters, family service providers, health services providers, immigrant service providers, reaching out to them has been really um, sort of um, maybe not easy, but they are sort of eager to assist and to uh, partner and collaborate. If you're in an academic setting, you really want to work closely with your Office of Engagement. So Purdue's Office of Engagement, a huge shout out to them because the work that they, um, they allowed me to do a lot of this work and make a lot of the connections that I needed to make to, to sort of complete my projects. So I did two um, fellowships. The first one was a service learning fellowship that focused on designing a service learning course that focused on helping you identify who your community partners should be. Um, they were the people who told me, you don't just want one big partner, you should also go out and find some smaller community grassroots organizations. Um, but they also gave me money. <laughs> and so they provided funding for my classroom for a teaching assistant because the class that we um, you know, taught had a lot of sort of, um, I was, students had a journal and I had to go through and read that. So having a teaching assistant was helpful. Um, and then having a community partner that we could actually pay. So being able to pay the salary or a part of the salary for our community partner or being able to actually offer them money was hugely beneficial. And then I also did a scholarship of engagement fellowship. So if you are an academic on the tenure track like me or tenured and thinking about going up for full, you'll know that Purdue cares very much about impact and about how you're measuring the impact of your work and that, that you're able to measure the impact of your work. And the Scholarship of Engagement Fellowship really taught me how to do that, how to design short and long-term assessments that would uh, make sure my engagement work was impactful. You have to be flexible, preparing for change, um, not just with the grassroots organizations, like I thought their leadership would change sporadically, but working with the State Department was actually really challenging because if you know anything about the diplomats, they only do two-year rotations in a place and then they go off and go do something else. So our diplomat that we were working with actually left over the summer and then when Matt and I started in the fall, the new person was kind of like, who are you? What are you doing? What is it? <laughs> Just sort of trying to find their way and so we had to adjust for that. We still ended up doing it but we definitely had to be more adaptable than we would have had to um, otherwise have been. So um, this can be especially challenging though if you are planning midterm or long-term assessments to suddenly have a new leadership model. Um, variances in communication with partners, for example, and changes in leadership. So that is my presentation. I didn't even have to bring my clock to see if I'm over time or under time, but I'm happy to take questions. We have a few minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yeah, I've been checking online. We're, we're still waiting for those to come in. I'm curious, Bethany, um, sort of what is the thing that you're most excited about with the opportunity with your um, uh, Fulbright in Finland? Like, what are you most, most looking forward to? 
So the thing that I'm most um, looking forward to about my opportunity in Finland is they are very keen on sort of a long-term collaboration. So they don't want me to just go for the year and then come back and never see them again. They are thinking about like, what would a study abroad look like? What if we did some sort of an exchange where Purdue students came to Finland or we could send Finland students to the US? Um, so I'm really excited to go over and talk to them about what that looks like because I also think that could be really exciting and um, you know I'm very open to that sort of collaboration. Okay, here we go. I'm really interested in the service learning concept, you know, of your of your work. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about service learning as a model for libraries. How common is it? I think, you know, I don't know that we necessarily come into the profession thinking about service learning. But, I'm, but you know, what Rachel is talking about and, and Samantha about this spiral, I mean, that's a service learning opportunity. So I think there's more and more um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I just, you know, philosoph philosophically, how do you think about service learning and how do we introduce that more broadly? I mean, I think that, that Purdue has a service learning fellowship is sort of indicative of how at least the university feels about service learning as a pedagogy. Um, and I think that really came from engineering with the EPICS project, where they were very keen on getting their engineers out into the community and out to help solve some um, really practical engineering problems. And then it sort of expanded. In the literature, I tend to see service learning as um, more of a social science or public health um, from a public health perspective as opposed to engineering. So I think Purdue might be a little bit unique there. Um, but from a library perspective, I don't know that I've seen, you know, service learning mentioned in some of the information and science literature. Not to say that librarians aren't doing that type of work, but um, I think we could be. And, you know, I think that my presentation shows, hopefully, pretty compelling why we should be doing it and why we might want to partner with public libraries or why we might want to sort of have our own service learning opportunities. Um, my feelings about it currently are that it does um, give us the opening to partner with public libraries in a way that we might not currently be doing. So if I had to tell you what a next step would be, um, that might be it. There's also some opportunities for maybe partnering with school librarians to, to do something. So I think more partnering across multiple types of libraries and librarianships might be a great next step. Any other questions? Anything online? Okay, well, let's all give a very um, big round of applause to Professor McGowan.